Hey, welcome to Aggressive Life. This is Brian. I uh, I, had, I had a pretty pretty emotional last hour and a half or so talking with uh, a spiritual father of mine, which is likely going to be the very last conversation I ever have with him. We're going to go into different territory here today with the aggressive life, and maybe I'm not over what just happened, but um, I think there's some things here that all of us need to hear and process. It um, it may be slow for you at times. It may be emotional for you at times, but I want us to grapple with some some of the transcendent things that we oftentimes don't think about with our lives and look at deeper questions and deeper meaning, and we're going to do it in the context of a conversation with a, a human being who uh, means maybe more to me than any other human being on the planet. That says a lot. No disrespect to my wife or my kids. <laughs> but this guy preceded them and has had a, has fingerprints all over my life. And so we're just going to allow this conversation to play and hope it helps you. Hey, welcome to The Aggressive Life. What's The Aggressive Life about? It's about not living passively. It's about seeing opportunities and taking them. It's about taking control of your life, seeing things that you have a passion about and that God may have a passion about, and deciding to throw your weight behind it. Today is going to be a very special one-of-a-kind podcast. I'm just telling you right now, you're going to hear a lot of pauses and a lot of weak voices from me because I have a guy with me who is one of the most important people in my life. His name is Denny Patton. This guy has lived his life. Anything that is happening positive in my life is happening because this guy aggressively came after me. I was a snot-nosed football player at Franklin Regional High School in the suburbs of Pittsburgh. And this guy had a ministry that was associated with something called Young Life. And uh, this guy saw me and he came after me. I remember sitting on the bench on the sidelines after coming in off of the field and he would heckle me. <laughs> he, would stand, he would stand behind the fence and say, hey, Tom, why don't you do something? Why don't you do something? Hey, why don't you do something? Little did I know that this was going to be an actual prophetic voice in my life. Hey, why don't you do something? I understood who God was for the first time as a result of this guy here today. I understood religion. I went to a religious home, but I didn't understand who Jesus was. And I did because this guy came after me and ran after me. Uh, I came into a a faith relationship with God through Jesus because of his tutelage. And then I actually went into ministry because this guy cast a vision for me of what my life could look like. He has been impressive to my life. I'm I'm going to be talking a lot today, but enough talking with me. Welcome to the aggressive life, Denny Patton. Good to be here. Good to see your face. In your little room over there, I know we're audio only, but I still see your face. <laughs> yes, yeah, so Denny and I are looking via Zoom and um, recording on something else. And uh, Denny is a warrior. He said to me in a text just the other day, he told me, I have weeks to live. Not months, not years, but weeks to live. He's been fighting cancer for how long now, Danny? How many years have you been fighting cancer? Uh, six, actually. Getting near six. And, and how, many, how many operations have you had? Uh, 16 surgeries for cancer, yeah. This is not a cancer podcast. This is not a, hey, let's be depressed podcast. It's not. I, ju- I just bring that out because I want you to understand the backdrop of why I want him on the aggressive life and why he's a why he's aggressively agreed uh, to do this. <laughs> this. This guy, as I'm looking at on the Zoom right now, this guy bears the marks 
of being in an unbelievable physical fight. It is an incredible act of strength, emotional, intellectual, spiritual, and physical strength for him to be sitting up and having this conversation. And he's been one of the strongest guys I ever knew to see you, Danny, right now with your, you know, lost, how much, how much weight have you lost? Uh, I think I've lost 90 pounds. Yeah. Well, lost 90 pounds. Yeah. Denny used to build into me bigly. There's a couple of things I want you to get from this episode. You know, one of the things in speaking is tell people what you want to tell them, tell them, then told, tell them what you told them. There's, there's two things I want you to get from today. I want you to see the impact of mentorship, somebody building into somebody else. And I want you to see a life, what it looks like to keep going after dreams, to keep laying it all down on the line. Denny has done that. He's physically a shell of what he was when I first knew him. He used to take me around and build into me and mentor me, uh, not by sitting in a classroom. He would just take me with me to all kinds of places. I remember going out to the Penn Hills area of Pittsburgh. He was in these softball leagues, basically semi-pro softball leagues, just beer drinking, guzzling leagues where these just manly steel workers were in and, and everyone wanted him on their team. It was this tall, muscular, sinewy guy would step up the batter and just crank softball after softball over the fence. Everybody wanted him on his team. Just, uh, j- just an impressive man. And so to see him losing some of his physical strength is very difficult to see, but it's way overwhelmed by the inspiring nature of what this man represents. Danny, I'm just going to tell you the phone call I had today, and then we'll get into the meat of our conversation. I had a staff meeting, Zoom meeting. It ended at, uh, supposed to end at 11. It was going a little slow, so I ended it at 10.50. The moment I ended that call, Reed Carpenter called me. Reed Carpenter is a mentor who built into Denny, and uh, Reed said to me, he said, hey, I know you got Denny today. You need to really make sure that people see the kind of life that he's lived. This is probably the last time he's ever going to speak publicly. And people need to see what it looks like to be a person of vision who actually goes after it and they just never stop. How does that resonate with you? Well, I think the, as you could tell, my voice is, you know, shallow. Uh, my physical being is shallow. I, I struggle to, you know, walk 20 steps without needing to sit down. But what's really strange is the, um, I mean, I get emotional like I am right now. But the spiritual side, excuse me, it never wavers. Uh, it's not like you try harder or you try to continue. It just, it continues. The calling of God, uh, it, it doesn't back off. It really actually has very little to do with physical. And you don't realize it until you're sick. When you're healthy, you take your health so for granted because you can get up in the morning and you can do everything you you want to do. The day is before you. You've rested. You feel refreshed. And you just tear into the day. With cancer, it it fools you. You think you're sleeping and you're resting. But when you wake up, you haven't rested. You're just as weak and tired as when you went to bed. But what is very strange is during the night— Spiritually, I get incredible visions. I get uh, things to do from God. I've always been a person who God speaks to me in kind of the half-dream state, where I'm not asleep, but I'm not awake. And it's in these states that I feel His calling to do things, and while I'm asleep, I think I can, because I forget until I wake up and I realize, wow, Where am I going to find the strength to do that today? But I still pursue it because, you know, the Bible says it very simply, in his weakness, you are strong. So you don't always know what you have to do when he gives you a vision. 
when he gives you a vision, it may be for somebody else to do now that my strength is, is waning. So I've kind of learned to realize God's giving me things possibly for other people to do. And so I try to pay attention. I'll try to talk when I, I know that you could say this more eloquently, but I want to save your energy for the things I want you to definitely say. So I'll give people a little bio of some of these spiritual visions, the things you've gone after since I've known you. You went after a vision to have a house with 16 bedrooms with a bunch of guys who were in that house being trained by you to do student ministry. I, I was in that house and the stories, stories that we could tell go on and on. We, we, were, we were a bunch of idiots, like idiots. We said, hey, let, let, let's, let's take the doors, one of the doors off of this building. This is an Episcopal church. Just took one of the doors off the building. We found a bow and an arrow, and we went out in the parking lot, and we would take a bow and arrow, and we would shoot it up in the air, and two guys holding the door would run back and forth and try to catch this arrow that would come down. <laughs> and that was that was under his watch. The, the arrows Denny used to take because the total dumbasses that we all were in the in the parking lot of that of that Episcopal church was 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 ridiculous. I remember one time you were walking in, you were walking into the to the back door, and you remember uh, Dale was three floors up with a. A bucket of water. And he poured water on you from three floors up. And it was like the only time I ever saw you afraid. It was like the, the, the sky was falling on you. You're, 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 the stuff that we put up, and, and you placed person after person in churches all around Cincinnati at that time. Many of those people who are still, still doing this. You went from there into having a vision for help kids sexually. You started a thing called Silver Ring Thing, where people would put a silver ring on their on their finger if they felt called by God to be abstinent until marriage. And you took massive arrows for that. Oh, you can't expect a kid to, 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 to say no to sexual urges. And you ended up being invited. Tell us a story. You were invited to Oxford to debate why teens should refrain from sex. And you said no. Why would you say no to going to Oxford to do that? Well, because we took on such a, such a controversial subject, uh, the other side that believed you should be able to have as much sex as you want, when you want it, wherever you want it, was challenging me at every turn. And I must have done, I don't know, a couple hundred interviews on all of the major networks across the nation, across the world, truly. We did not call one person for an interview. They called us. And I started getting these calls after we did a documentary with the BBC called American Virgins. It was a one-hour documentary where they sent it out to 171 nations and uh, played it so that everybody in the world found out about the Silver Ring thing, which is something only God can do, of course. And it was during that that Oxford heard about it and wanted me to come debate uh, abstinence at something called the Oxford Union, which is the longest debating society in the history of the world. I think they started like in 1823, and they've had every president, Winston Churchill, all these people, Albert Einstein. I mean, all these people have debated at the Oxford Union. And I, I told the guy who was the president of it, I'm not interested in coming. And he said, why not? And I said, well, I don't really believe that much in debate. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, all it really seems to me is one person says one thing, then the other person says the opposite, opposite thing, then the other person comes back and says the opposite of what he just said, and it just goes back and forth, but neither one is convinced. But debating is supposed to convince people, but it rarely does in this day and age. And I was so busy with what I was doing that I saw it only as a distraction. Everybody told me I should do it because it would give me higher profile. I would get more people interested in it. But I am a man who likes to do things and get things done and I really don't care much about, you know, how that gets into your credit column. So I told the guy no maybe 15 different times, and he finally convinced me to fly me over first class, the whole nine yards. I mean, and I, I said, okay, I'll come. And it was only because people— First would, class. Okay, first class. <laughs> All right. If, if I can have free alcohol, although you don't drink, if I can have right. free nuts, then fine, I'll come over. 
Well, they, a lot of people who loved me told me I should go and were praying for me. So I finally allowed that to happen. Well, anyway, I went over there and I did the debate. And uh, I won't take you through the whole debate, but the way they judge who wins or loses the debate is there are about, I don't know, 800 students from the colleges, the Oxford colleges. The ones that went out the left door, when you walk out the left door, you voted for one side. If you walk out the right door, you vote for the other side. And so I was out in the parking lot afterwards, and the president comes up to me, says, would you like to know how the debate ended? I said, yeah, whatever, you know. And he said, well, you, you guys lost. I said, well, that doesn't surprise me at all. He says, well, what surprised us is you only lost by seven votes. Mm. And um, what blew me away is I went over there to share my, my faith. I felt like it was a great chance to talk to 800 students about Christ and how a guy who has atheistic parents could know Jesus Christ I said, and the only reason you invited me over here is because of that, because if that wasn't happening, I wouldn't care about abstinence. I'm into abstinence because God is into abstinence. I, I teach that because it's biblical. So I shared my faith, and I don't know what God did from there, but uh, I came back, and nothing changed. You know, I can't name one thing to change from it. Maybe God did things I haven't seen, uh, but yeah, I went over but to you, Oxford. You hit on a great thing, Denny, about about— vision, though, it, it's really about what you do. It's not really about what you say. I mean, we can say things if we want to cast vision and motivate people to it, but you've, ju you've just been a doer. You haven't been a thinker. You haven't been a philosopher. You haven't been a, you know, a writer. Fine to do all those things, but vision is really about mobilizing people, and, and you've just done things that I've been inspired by again and again. I have, I have a very simple philosophy. I came to Christ— as I said, both my parents are atheists. My father died an atheist. My mother is 97 years old and a full-blown atheist, and she can't hardly meet with me because I, she doesn't want me to come around and talk about faith. And um, so for me, it's always been very simple, the calling. The calling, whether I'm playing sports or whatever I'm doing, I have a very simple, f fundamental style of hitting a baseball, hitting a golf ball, whatever it is, and it's, you know, the basics. And the basic reason I believe I'm on the earth is to love and know God. And my purpose is to help as many people get to heaven as possible. And the fundamental here is very simple. If you go to heaven, you win. If you go to hell, you lose. No matter how barely you get into heaven— by the skin of your teeth, if you get into heaven, you win. But if you miss heaven, by the skin of your teeth, you lose. So what am I doing today to talk to the people that cross my path and help the best way I know how, using God's giftedness he's put in me, to convince them that heaven is worth it? And so that's been really, the that's how I've lived my life. I it sounds kind of simplistic, but that's where it started, and it's still true today. You know, even the projects I'm doing today are about how is this going to help somebody get to heaven? Well, and that's, that's why I'm where I am right now. You didn't, you didn't come to the church that my parents went to that I stopped going to. You didn't go to the, the youth group that I stopped going to when I was 13, so it was, oh, yeah, I, I'd given up on all that stuff. You know, you came to me, who was not in religious environments— because you had a heart for me, and you knew that I might turn my back on religion, but I wasn't necessarily up for turning my back on a relationship with Christ. Um, that's part of why Crossroads, the church that's my day job, gets as much criticism as it has. I'm, I'm fine when people from other churches come here if they're part of the vision. That, that's fine. But God didn't need another church with more people who want a new worship thing or new, more people who want a new pastor who's whatever, whatever. It was like, no, there's, there, there's new people that we need to run after. And I got that from you, and I'm so thankful for it. What I didn't see in you, and I was thinking about this before the interview, what I didn't see in you back in the days of training, I didn't realize, because I'm not sure you realized, that God had placed very similar skill bases in me that he's placed in you. For instance, your ability to catch vision. I just assume everybody can do that. I didn't know I had any special ability to capture vision. It's when you get wiser in life and you realize, no, you're, it's not everybody. 
It's actually very few. But it's not just getting a vision. It's then having wisdom to know which visions to run with. And then when you think about which visions to run with, you start counting the cost of leadership and what it's going to take to make that vision work. And then after all of that, you still have to have faith that you know what you're doing. Because God's called you to do something, your flesh, the world, Satan still tries to convince you you don't have what it takes to pull that off. When you're talking about big stuff in particular, it really gets frightening. But because God has given you the gift of vision, the gift of wisdom, the gift of leadership, but most importantly, the gift of faith. You know, the spiritual gift of faith is best stated in its opposite. It's the lack of doubt. The gift of faith means you don't doubt. Well, if God's given you something to do and you have the gift of faith, not everybody has the spiritual gift of faith. We are people that don't doubt that we can get it done. It's not like you're some hero and you're stronger than the next guy and you can, you can fight strong. No, you don't have the doubt that a lot of people can't get rid of because you have the spiritual gift of faith. And when you have that, God can take you to some amazing places. And you know it's not you. When we got interviewed just by the BBC, and believe me, it was one of 350 interviews, and they did a one-hour documentary. They came and filmed us for three months. They traveled everywhere we went for three months with four staff people and put this major documentary together, together and sent it all over the world. You can't do that. I can't do that. I can't accomplish that. It's way beyond my pay grade. Only God but you still had to have the faith before it so that God could show you what he can do. And that's what I'm so most appreciative about you, Brian, is you have those, skill, those skills and those uh, spiritual gifts, but you have the faith to believe, to go for it. That's the aggressive life, man. That's the aggressive life. Mm. Your most, uh, your, your latest vision, not your, God's vision he gave, he gave you, I find very inspiring. Denny has, uh, I don't know what you call it, written, amassed, accumulated, produced a devotional called Family First. Family I'll Wins, him, actually. Oh, excuse me. Family, family wins, wins. Yeah. Family Wins. Um, I'll let you uh, talk about that project in a moment, but just, just let me tell you, the, the, kind, the kind of dude my mentor is, what, what, what's going on here? There's not a lot of people who, when they're fighting cancer for six years, are looking for a new vision. There's not a lot of people who, when they get a vision, are actually exerting themselves to fulfill that vision, even though people are telling you you're not going to be around to see that vision. Just, just, just spend your last days, your last weeks, your last years, you know, watching Netflix and and, and sucking on lollipops or whatever you want to do. Just, just do that. Just slow down and just be his grandfather on a chair with an Afghan on your lap. Then he's actually gone out and he's gone after this vision. Family wins. <laughs> and I'm told that, that you have raised money and you have spent your personal money and you have in your basement or in your garage right now hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of product that's sitting there trusting that that's going to get to the right people because God gave you a vision for that. Explain. Well, I've been reading a devotional for 30 years. Same devotional. Now, I don't think too many people can say that. I'm not sure one other person can say that. But the devotional is so deep and it is so powerful and it's scripture. It's the New Testament broken into 365 readings with a full page of scripture and a full page of devotion. It's not a verse with some comments. It's God's word, which if that's all it was, is enough. But then to have somebody comment on it for you and ask you to do a couple things every day, it changed my life. And I would just try my best to read it every day. But I began to realize that a lot of people don't spend time with God every day. So I went to the Geico commercial, and on the Geico commercial, it's just 15 minutes a day. And that's what God gave me. What if people would just were asked to spend just 15 minutes a day? Would you at least do that? So that kind of concept 
captured me. What would happen if people spent 15 minutes a day with God every day? What would you expect to happen? I would expect people to begin to grow spiritually like they've never grown before because so very few do it. So why aren't people doing it? This is how my mind goes. This is how God works. The reason they're not doing it is because they're distracted. Because if you ask them if they want to do it, they'd say yes. Even quasi Christians who aren't doing great, who have families that are messed up, want to spend time with God. But it's either a distraction or they haven't found a product or they don't know what. So we began to say, well, what if we created such a product? What would that look like? So we took this devotion, we got permission to republish it, and we recovered it into a, a modern day leather cover. It's a beautiful devotion. And then we created a companion app. And the companion app is what sets this thing apart because you can have this devotion read to you. So let's say you forgot and you left it at home. You're in your car driving somewhere. Turn off the radio, click on the app, and let somebody read it to you this morning. Who is that somebody? Their mothers, their fathers, their, their younger teenagers, their college students. We have 200 and I think 80 people who read in this piece of it, the New Testament. Then I got a whole nother group of pastors. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, by the way. Thanks for you, inviting me to read. I, I, I guess I, I'm not spiritual enough I for you. I actually have some left if you want to do it. Because yeah, we also right. have a pastor. Oh, no, don't give me your sloppy <laughs> leftovers. Don't like, oh, let's give Brian Leviticus or something. It no, man, you give I, all the good stuff to somebody else. I know I don't make your cuts. Screw you. Hey, don't think I didn't think about you a lot. I just felt like <laughs> you were so busy. Uh, I didn't call a lot of busy pastors for this. But I did call a lot of pastors. I have a whole nother group of pastors that read it but then make a, a three-minute comment about the verse and pray a prayer of salvation. So we have people coming to Christ through this devotional. And then we put together a video that supports the day, a worship song that supports the day, a place to journal, a place to write comments online, and a place to create small groups. All this is, this is in the app. So now we have a way, like I've surprised myself how much I enjoy the app more than even reading the devotional, or oftentimes I'll do them together. But that was the vision to create a resource that works in the 21st century that hopes to take away excuses and distractions and help solve some of those problems. Just 15 minutes a day, create a new habit is the idea. Now, you say, you say we. We did we, we, we. There's not a lot of we and we. It's not like you, you have some big organization with staff members you just put. We is who? You and your wife? Yes, that's uh, a great answer there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, no, really, for a lot of my life, I felt very prideful. I, was a, I felt like I was a very prideful person. And I said, I a lot. A lot. Uh, I don't know if I can even say it anymore. It hurts. It hurts to say I. Uh, even if it's just me and God, it's we, because he's asked me to help him. He's the I. I get to be the we. It's not I, and God gets a, a check mark and a credit call. It's we. But yes, I have tremendous help. Like I said, I have 280 people who've read in this thing. I have pastors who've read in it. I've had people help me develop the, the app and the website and all that takes to put something out there today. I had people help me with publishing and, and printing these Bibles. I printed them overseas. I had to have them shipped in from Belarus. I mean, you know, it's crazy. But I have 30,000 of them, and people said, you're printing too many. And they're right, I printed too many. Unless God has another plan. But I was told to print 30,000, that's what we printed. And so, you know, they're, they're going to be there until God uses them. And so the we is not hard for me anymore, but it used to be very hard. Uh, boy, that's a, that is a great, great word for us. You know, I think that's one of the dangers of those of us who do have the gift of faith or do get stewarded a vision from God, it's just very easy to 
to get into than our own thing. It's just really easy to get intoxicated with the victories or the wins. And before you know it, a little, little pride seeps in. And as you said, God just gets some credits in the, in the, he, he gets listed in the credits, but internally it becomes about us and not about him. That's a, that's a great, You know, Brian, I looked up your name on the website on uh, Google yesterday. I was shocked at how little I could find about you. They couldn't find much information on you. I'm telling you, I could look up a lot of the pastors, and it really spoke to me. I remember when you told me you were thinking about taking a pretty significant church in California that was chasing you down hard, that all the dollar bills you would need to do anything you ever needed to do in ministry, the dollar bills were just sitting on the sidelines ready to go. And you said at that time, I realized I'm a Midwest guy. I'm a Midwest person. And I have Midwest roots and Midwest values. And one of those values is you can't find a lot written about Brian Tome and what Brian Tome has done. And I think that speaks volumes of you. And I was refreshed to see that yesterday or not see it yesterday. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yep. Uh, there's so many layers to un- unpack here and untie. When you start talking about what it took to get 30,000 devotionals in, I mean, what I hear, I just get stressed. I get tired hearing about it. <laughs> some people think, oh, well, you just kind of made some calls. You raised some money. I, I I hear like amazing amounts of discernment, trying to find the publisher, trying to find the voices, who's going to record it, who's going to put all the packaging together. How am I going to get the word out? What's the distribution of this? How, how did the, the, the coding on the app? Oh my gosh, everyone just think, oh yeah, now doing an app, is incredibly hard. It's incredibly complicated. Finding somebody who will code, finding somebody who's affordable, finding somebody who gets, I mean, it, it, it's a horse choking amount of work. Talk to us about just the difficulty of executing a vision. Well, normally that kind of stuff actually, it's, it kind of uh, gives me energy. But unfortunately I was going through chemo, radiation, surgeries, uh, recovering from that, not having strength. So I'd come in the office, I could sit in my chair, but I couldn't do anything many days, you know. I woke up that way this morning, I had no energy. So those are always the hard parts because I didn't have the ability to chase. But what happened was because the vision, I, I for the first time in my life had enough time we didn't do this immediately. This vision came into my brain for the first time in January 2019. It was in the summer of 2019 when I was in Colorado. God showed me what all I had in January is the family wins. That's all I had. I had a name. I had no idea what it meant, but I was absolutely convinced it was called the family wins. How does a family win? A family wins when the parents spend time with God personally every day. That family will win. That's how simple it was, but I didn't know how to execute it. I didn't know what God was saying. It was when I was reading my devotional, it was like, why don't you slap yourself in the head three or four times with this devotional? This is what I've had you doing this for 30 years for, preparing you to know you have it. Well, nobody's going to let me republish this. And well, yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. So I began to raise some money. Well, people said, I really love this. Here's big chunks of money. That was a statement that said, Denny, God's calling you to this because who gives money to something that it's not even there, not even close to being there. But they believed in it. So I was able to purchase things and pay as we went. And uh, so the journey of getting it done was uh, trying to focus on Christmas 2020. So when you're starting in January 2019, it seems pretty simple. You got lots of time until COVID drops down on you. Mm. Mm. I had no idea COVID was coming, but God did. God knew the whole time. Well, if you were more spiritual, he would have given you that vision. You could have yeah. planned for it. But he also says, you know, he also lets you know that 
COVID's coming, and what I've given you is exactly what people need. They need to be convinced there is truly hope at the end of this tunnel. As much as may be going wrong in the world right now, this idea of spending personal time with God never changes. If it is done, if you will do it, your family will win. I guarantee it. Your family will win because God won't let that come back void. His word will not come back void. That's a promise. Do you believe it is, is the end of the, the end game? And so that's what drove me and, and the people who were in agreement with me, willing to come alongside me. My daughter and my wife have been very helpful. They're a part of our staff that gets all these readers. All the sound that comes in has to be, you know, tweaked. All these people reading, they're not perfect when it comes back to you. You know, you know that. So all that had to be done by my daughter. I means a lot of things have happened. But uh, I'm very excited about it because when I read it, I get excited about it. And that says to me, at least, it's better than I thought it was going to be. So I'm very pleased with it. Well, I can't wait to see it. I'm going to um, I'm going to get a copy. You sent me a couple times. And I, for some reason, I keep having mail get lost to my house. It's really weird. So I know you sent me free ones, but I'm going to put an order in and buy some. We're, at the end of the podcast, we're going to give people all the information they can to be able to tap into it uh, as well. But just give us a... Give us a little clinic. When someone has a vision, when someone gets an idea that they think is God-generated, because that, that's what it is for me. You, I, I get some idea, and it's so interesting. It's so outside of my personal normal thinking that I go, that's exactly the kind of God, the kind of thing God will put in my mind. And then it becomes personal, Right. When someone gets one of those things, whether the vision is to start a business, start a devotional, or simply start a date night with your wife, what are, what are the roadblocks that we come up against? Or what are, the, what are the things that we should be doing or thinking? Well, not every vision is monumental, you know what I'm saying, as far as changing the world. But it could be monumental going out on a date with your wife, too, though. So the big and the small cross over each other all the time. And the small built into the big. On vision, the way I discern a vision from a thought, a vision from, oh, that's a good idea. Maybe I'll try that. Is I envision throwing it up against the wall like you would throw spaghetti up against the wall. If it sticks, I credit the Holy Spirit. If it falls to the ground, I credit myself. Like the idea falls to the ground. Holy Spirit-led vision sticks to the wall. It stays up there. And tomorrow you see it again. And two weeks later, it's still on the wall. And at some point, God says, hey, Brian, hey, Denny, I, I just gave you something to do. And you look back, you go, yeah, I know. I just, I wasn't paying attention. And when you see it sticking to the wall, it's day in and day out. It's, it's over time. It, it, some of them could be two weeks. Some of them could be two days, and you get it. But it doesn't fall off until you address it. And so I chase what sticks to the wall. I try to chase that uh, to the best of my ability. Sometimes it's multiple things. I'm sure you've had that in your life. Sometimes it's really expensive and way outside your comfort zone. And, you know, that's tough. You, you really, I don't know if you remember this. I hadn't thought about this for literally decades when I was living in the house with you. Again, Denny, he had the, he had the top penthouse suite in a, in a hundred year old house that didn't have any HVAC. And we went up there and painted the walls and took some red, ugliest red carpet he thought was cool down down on the floor, and 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 he had his little water bed up there. You, you're one of the cool kids who had a king size water bed. You know, and you're up in your own little domain up there. You know, we, the rest of us little peons were were down the lower levels, and and I was cooking spaghetti, and you actually taught me how to know that the spaghetti noodle was done. You came down and said, 
Well, throw it against the wall. Actually, it was the ceiling. Throw it up there, and if it sticks, then it's done. I said, really? (laughs) There's probably still spaghetti that's stuck to the top of the ceiling at at Broad Street outside of uh, outside of St. Stephen's. It's 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 interesting the things that you've you've taught me and you've built into me that you just you didn't even think about. That's the power of mentorship. Let's talk about let's talk about mentorship for a little bit. W- what about when you build into somebody? How how do you do that? If I if, if I'm trying to pour my life into somebody, what are some of the secrets to it? Well you probably don't know you're doing it when you're doing it unless you're just intentionally trying to be a mentor. So like, let's say you sign up to be a mentor, you realize you're doing it. But most mentorships are, are you living your life, having character, having something about you that somebody else wants. The old adage, you know, if you want to be a leader, look over your shoulder and see if there's anybody following you. If there's nobody following you, you're just out for a walk. You're not a leader. A leader, if people are following you, well, why would anybody follow you? Because somehow, some way, God has given you the wherewithal to attract people. And mentoring to me is attracting people to what Christ is doing in your life, making that attractive. It's exactly what you do with men and the aggressive life and all those things you do. You're trying to attract men and women to see Christianity different than anybody else sees it, experiencing Christianity different than anybody else experiences it, because it's how you're made up. And you're trying to take what makes you excited and put it into a sauce that other people can cook with as well and put their life into as well. And it doesn't work for everybody, so you're not going to mentor everybody. But when you look back over your shoulder, you'll know who you mentored because time has passed. Not because you've spent time mentoring somebody. Time has gone by, and it's still happening. I have a guy in my life who's mentored me for 50 years, calls me four times a week, has stood with me through this whole cancer thing like nobody, you know, was the best man at my wedding. He led me to Christ in high school. He doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't have a formal mentoring program that he wrote out for me. He just lived the life that was attractive to me. And I wanted to be like him. I wanted to do things like he did things. I wanted to live my life the way he lived his life. That's mentorship. It's, it's seeing. It's like youth ministry is not caught. It's not taught. It's caught. I think mentoring is caught not taught. And you're not necessarily meant to mentor 40, 50 people. Maybe if you're a pastor, you could call some of that mentoring or pastoring. But even in that, you're only going to mentor a few. And it's, it's best to just let people line up as God lines them up and don't worry about it. Just keep going and keep pushing and watch how many people find that attractive. And the mentoring process almost happens by accident in some ways. You know what I'm saying? It just almost happens because you're not, you're just living a character built life. Yeah, it does happen by accident. Yes, I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying, but you were very intentional to go out of your way and say things to me that were important to inform me. And you didn't have to say them, but you did say them. Things like, I'll just kind of go through some laundry list. Things like, uh, I gave a talk and I was criticized by somebody that, uh, that I had too much Bible in the talk. Imagine that, because no one accuses me of that anymore. Anyway, I was accused that I had too much, too much Bible in the talk. And uh, I don't know if you remember what you said, but I just I tell you, what, what would what, what you say? I said, don't ever let anybody tell you that again. Don't you ever give a talk without the Bible in front of you that's speaking about Jesus Christ and God. They need to know where your source is. They need to know who it is you're speaking about and from what source. It's not Brian Tome giving his thoughts. It's the Bible speaking in and of itself. How dare anybody tell you not to use the Bible in a message? I don't know if I ever told you this story, but uh, I tell you the one time 
that I broke from what you said was a failure. I, uh, th there was this big company, uh, Johnson & Johnson, that was having a sales meeting in Cincinnati. And uh, the guy who was running the sales me meeting came to Crossroads. And he said, we've got this uh, NCAA championship winning coach of uh, University of Kentucky. Oh, I can't remember the guy's name right now. But um, uh, he's coming. And uh, I've been here to speak. I think you do a great job. But uh, would you come and do like a, a little talk to for all these sales folks from in my region? I said, um, yeah, yeah, all right. So so I did. And I basically just did, did what I did on the weekend, except a little, a little less churchy, you know, a little less Christian-y. And the, the surveys came back and they were through the roof. Like everyone liked what I had to say more than this, you know, this, this A-lister. So it got to, got to Johnson and Johnson and they asked me to go down to the Doral Country Club to speak to their en entire sales force across the whole country. And so I was like, all right, um, uh, I, I got something good. Well, I got on the phone with this guy who was organizing. It was obvious this guy was hyper concerned that I was going to be preaching and this and that. And he, man, he just starts scrubbing down everything I was going to say, just, just scrubbing it. And I weenied, I weenied. I, I know I'm not called to a sales meeting to preach. I know that. I know that. In fact, I want more sales meetings because there's a nice check that goes along with it. I'm not stupid, right? <laughs> so, so, but I listened to this guy. I, 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 I scrubbed out stuff that I knew wouldn't have been, I scrubbed and it was awful awful. The, the, the worst talk I've ever given in front of the most unique audience I ever could have had. And I, I, and I broke with your counsel. Pissed me off right now. I've, still does. I've done it too. I've done it too. I, uh, but you know, God has his favor. He takes care of things, but it's a, I don't know. I just can't think of something like flying all the way over to Oxford, England, going through this whole thing with them, I was not going to come back without sharing the gospel. I, I, there may have been a lot of things I will or won't do, but I will not come back without sharing the gospel with those 800 kids because it's, it's too important, you know. Uh, so I think it's the Word of God has power that we don't have. And uh, I'm never afraid of it, never afraid of it. Let me give you another one. Another one, running after people. You used to say that again and again and again. Run after people. What does that mean? Well, I see people out there that God kind of puts in your path, and you've got to go the extra yard. You know, you've got to do extra things. Like you said, me showing up at a football game. I really didn't have much interest in Franklin Regional football. You know what I'm saying? Where you were playing football. But I know that was your environment. Running after Brian Tome meant showing up at the football game. But it wasn't just Brian. It was Brian and a lot of other people. But you responded, see? I don't know who's going to respond. I'm running after people. God then singles people out. And if you're paying attention... You'll see those, he singles out, and you begin to have a more spiritual experience with those people. Like you went to Laurelville. All the football team necessarily go to Laurelville. Some of them did, but you went to Laurelville, a, a weekend camp, and you gave your life to Christ. Well, then I asked you if you would share your testimony with all of your friends, and a couple weeks later at your house, and the football team showed up, and you had a very good opportunity to be scared and not do it, but you did it. And those were the beginning days to realize you were set apart. You weren't first just First time I ever wept. First yeah. time I ever wept, ever, let alone weeping in public, standing in the corner of your own living room. Like, uh, it was like, uh, it was the weirdest thing, man. I, I, do you remember that? I mean, I just, I just was overcome by, I don't know what it was, emotion, the spirit of God, whatever. And there I am, trying to tell my story of what God's done to me. And I just can't, I can't get it out. And I had a guy come up to me after at McDonald's afterwards. Said, hey, that, that, that thing that happened, was that, was that you or was that God? And I said, no, nah, it was God. One of the most embarrassing moments of my life, but 
Um, yeah, I was running after people. I was wanting to run. It's going to be in my house. You're going to come. I'm going to invite everybody I possibly can. <laughs> I'm not going to like put a flyer out or send an email out. We didn't have email, but run after people. Just, just, just make the aggressive move. I learned that from you, brother. It's amazing to me that if you see a group of people and you chase them down, God's going to pick out people who he wants to do things with. Like, for instance, you had a calling on your life when you were 13 and you walked out of your youth ministry program. You still had a calling on your life. That hadn't. That was still there. It hadn't been the people God had prepared to bring that calling out hadn't entered into your life yet. It's just interesting that when you keep chasing after people, the, the people who have callings on their lives become more apparent. Think about, I think about you being in a, in a training program in our leadership house, not seeing anything special about you. I mean, you're a good friend of mine, actually. You're probably my better, one of my better friends. We go running together. We do some things athletically together. Where you felt like a schoolgirl every time we ran together. I, 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 don't really, I don't really feel bad about that. It's very true. But um, I didn't see the vision, visionary side of you. I didn't see that. I didn't know that was in you. I had no idea. I don't know if you had it either. No, I you know? didn't. Definitely not. But when those gifts came together and you moved to Cincinnati in particular, and all those gifts became apparent, that's when you see running after many to see one and what one can do for the Lord, you know, and you only have one life to give. So it's not about how many, it's about, you know, chasing after a lot to find the few that God has called and help them get in place, you know, kind of that's a lot of, a lot more not finished out the bottom of the funnel, if you know what I mean. They've gone in the top. They don't make it to the bottom too often. That's, that's a really, that's a really another angle. It's a good word. I was, I was an absolute late bloomer. No, I did not. I, I didn't. A, a, any positive thing someone sees in me right now, no one saw that in me when I was, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Um, yeah, that's maybe a topic for another day, but that's, you, that's you part of the gift, whole— though. Here was your gift. Your gift was you were fun to be around. Oh, well, big deal. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. You were fun to be around. People wanted to hang out with you. You, you had a lot of fun. You had a big laugh, you know, a lot of joy in you, a lot of craziness in you. And that's cool, and that's fun for that period of time. But as that develops into vision, that fun is what the aggressive life is about. You're doing it because it's fun to be a Christian with an aggressive life, you know? So that plays in. But you had the gift of being a joy to be around, for I'm sure. Looking at my, I'm looking at the producer in the room right now is doing sound things. I'm looking over his, through his mask, and he's laughing right now. I can tell he's wanting to know some stupid thing that I did that was fun that you thought was ridiculous. What, will, what, what, what would that one of those things be? Wow. For you in particular, I, when you got out of high school, I didn't think you were college material. Like you had, done, you had not done very well in high school academically, right? Correct. And so you wanted to come in the program. I remember you asking if you could come in the program. I wanted you to be in the program. But I just didn't think you could get the college work done. And um, so there's God working. Took me seven years. I got it done. Seven yeah. years. Come on, man. But think about how God overcomes things. Yeah. You know, because what you think you see, and you're so f smart, quote unquote, because we were an academic program. We, you had to go to college for four years while you're in this program. But there are times when you just throw that stuff out the window and you go with your gut instincts, and you, you trust. You don't know why you trust it. I don't know why we trusted putting you in the program. There's another guy in the program, what's his name? He didn't belong in the program either. You know, but he turned out to be a tremendous man of God. And so you just don't, you don't know when you see the, like you said, late bloomer, or you're, I was not very mature growing up either. I don't know if I'm mature today, you know? I love the little kid inside a person. I, that's very attractive to me. People who do ministry with the little kid flown out of them, that's the ministry that's most attractive to me. And I saw that in you, for sure. I am definitely still a little kid. 
I embrace my junior high, my inner junior high child. Yep. <laughs> I embrace it. Uh, here's another one. Last week we had a service. Um, at the end of the service, the first one actually was through the practice run. I was not happy. I was not happy at all. And um, first time I've been viscerally angry in front of a room full of people for performances that was were really, really bad. The whole idea of criticizing performance came from you. That sounds so awful, criticizing performance. Okay, I'll make it better. Uh, critiquing, critiquing what you could have done better. Every time I gave a talk or every time I, I led a skit or every time I, I led some song, every time we would sit down and you would tell me what you thought about it. That, that attention to detail and that immediate feedback um, has been huge for me. And it's something I still do with uh, others do to me and I do to others. Why, why would you do that? Well, I think people are too afraid of hurting people's feelings. And yet you've been put out there by God to reach many, in your case, many, many, many people. And by letting a few feelings not be hurt because you refuse to be honest with them, that's a nice way of saying it, hurts so many more. And so, yes, there's good ways and bad ways to do it. I've definitely had my share of bad day days of saying it the wrong way. But I always felt like people would, sh would, they would quit in the last 10%. Like everything was good and it wouldn't finish. They wouldn't finish. Like you're running a race, okay, I'm tired, but I got, I, if I just run this last quarter of a mile hard, I'm not going to die. Finish it. Like, you know, why not finish? And a lot of stuff isn't finished in the church today. I mean, for instance, youth ministry is a complete mess right now in churches. It's terrible what's going on with youth ministry. I couldn't be more ashamed of it. And that's critical. But I, I traveled the country with Silver Ring thing. I saw what was going on. And very little to impress me at all. Um, I'm very critical of, because I believe there's a way to do it right. It's a way to make it happen. But people are just distracted and they don't finish. They don't, they don't say, look, I know you have a church of 2,000 and you got 300 people in the youth group. That's nothing. You're coasting. You're coasting on somebody else's laurels. What about those thousand kids that run around your church every day? Does anybody care about them? Because I was one of them. I was the one running outside the church. So I, 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 take, I take it personally. So the idea of finishing and being critical is because I mean, Jesus was critical about religion when it was done wrong, wasn't he? He was very, who was he most mad at? The most religious, because they were doing it wrong. It wasn't, the, it wasn't the truth, it was the truth done wrong. And so, I don't, I know, I'm not saying I'm Jesus, but I'm saying that there's reason to be critical because you want the best for the most. And you have to be careful not to hurt people's feelings, but... You can't let a few destroy what is meant for so many more. So I guess that was my rationale for it, you know? Yeah, it was obvious that you were okay with the risk of hurting me so that you could help the many. It wasn't right. about how I felt about that feedback. It was about enabling next time more people to be helped if I was pointed in the right direction. You are very clear about that. We're getting into a bad habit. You know, I don't want you to think that was good enough because there was more inside you than that. There was, you just didn't finish or somebody doesn't finish. Like, I don't know what happened in your services this weekend, but maybe you just didn't think somebody practiced enough or thought it through far enough. Or it wasn't when, if people try hard, I, I'm all in there with them because I, I don't always do the best job of giving a message or, but I really don't like when I get up and give a message and know that I didn't prepare well and it wasn't good. And it really upsets me, you know. So I'm as critical about right. myself as anybody else. Trust me. I think it starts there, by the way, Brian. You got to be critical enough about yourself to know before you can be critical about somebody else. You got to hold yourself to those high standards, you know. Right. Well, it's it's aggressive mistakes, right? I I got upset this weekend because it looked like people were being passive, 
phone, uh, the, to the phrase I used with them was phoning it in. And yeah, if we make it, if, if something is awful and doesn't go well because we went to the nth degree, okay, fine. Not, not everything's going to be good. There's no problem. Nothing. Anything, but if we've got a work ethic problem, which is why it isn't good or a sloppiness problem. Okay. Well then that's, that's, when I'm going to get a little upset. And, um, I'm just thankful that you, you showed me that. Let, let's, let's just capture your last, we're, we're coming down the final, the final, the final stretch on this. I know that this has taken a lot of energy for you and you've poured a lot into us, but uh, I just want to make sure that we're connecting the dots. You talked about finishing strong. You talked about the final quarter mile. You talked about, you know, just going for it. That's not, that's not, um, that, that's not some interesting chicken soup for the soul idea that you could read and think about. That's something you're literally doing while you're being whittled away by cancer. You are literally finishing strong. You're literally dropping spiritual truth bombs on us right now. You're going after a vision. You're expending your financial resources for it. You are, you're, you're go, go, going. So we believe in you. I believe in you. Tell us with family, the family wins. How do we win? How do we get a hold of that? What's just, just, just put, put your sales hat on. I'm, I'm asking you to sell to us, make a sale, finish strong, Denny. Well, I want to make a sale that will change people. You know, I want to make a sale that I believe in, because if I don't believe in that, I don't care because I'm gone anyway. You know what I'm saying? So what do I care if there's inventory left? It doesn't matter to me, you know? in some respects. But what does matter to me is that there's a, a family member in your congregation that's going to send their son or daughter off to college. And 60 to 90 percent of student, of people lose their faith in college. I think it's only 69 percent never come back to their faith. And yet we do all this work in church and all this discipleship and all this work to see those kids be strong enough to go off to college, and it doesn't even come close. What would happen if a mother was connected to a resource at a college like Fellowship of Christian Athletes or Navigators, and that mother purchased three of these devotionals, gave them to the person in the college who was running a ministry, and that person helped their son or daughter and one of their friends they met in college start spending 15 minutes a day with God. And we began to develop a whole college ministry around that to say, we can attack this problem. I'm not going to say we solve it, but we can attack it. Uh, what would happen if your entire congregation, we had a church in Pittsburgh, decide, the pastor decided, we're going to read through the New Testament together in 2020, or we're going to start on Lent or whenever, and I'm going to ask every member of my congregation to read through the Scriptures together for one year, and I think we have the tool for that. I believe we have it. It's a, it's a beautiful devotional. Like I said, I used it for 30 years, still use it, but the app that comes with it takes it over the top. What would happen if every person in your church who is reading the New Testament and the pastor speaking into that monthly or whatever also said, and I want you to think of one or two family members you're going to convince to do the same, because we have a lot of hurting family members. All of a sudden, you have an outreach for your, for your church built around the simple idea, idea of spending 15 minutes a day with God. And really, the 15 minutes I spend every day in that app and that devotion is very powerful. It's not light at all. It so makes how me, much is the devotional? Devotional, I think, is $34. And $34. The app, and the app comes with it. Yeah, because we give a 10% discount. Okay. If you buy five or more, we give you a 15% discount. But the church that did it, they really went for it. They pretty much got the entire church reading through the New Testament for this year. So that would be, that's my great vision, not just for your church, Brian, and, and your, and your uh, campuses, but, or even for your prison ministries, but for all churches that we could touch. I mean, that would be my great joy. So 34 bucks. I get a leather-bound devotional. I get access to an app with fresh, inspiring content. And how do I how do I get this? Where do I go? 
uh, you go to thefamilywins.org. Pretty simple, thefamilywins.org. And uh, you can shop there. You can read about it. There's a video, a couple of videos there. So, yeah, it's pretty well developed. I actually feel good about the website. Um, two last questions, Denny. Okay. Uh, any, oh, I'll tell you what they are. One's going to be any last thing that you want to say to us. Talk about that we haven't talked about. And then um, uh, right. I, I'll ask the second question. <laughs> Look, answer that one for anything else you want to say before I ask the last question. Anything else that we want to, you want to talk about that we haven't talked about? Well, I think that I hope that people understand how much God wants to use them, but how few people are prepared to being used. You know, Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful. That's a great word, plentiful. But the labors are few. Pray. Pray that God will send laborers. And that's my prayer. As I leave the planet, I just pray that my time on the planet develop some harvesters. That God used me and the personality he gave me and the giftedness he gave me to help some harvesters understand the tasks they're supposed to be doing. If that requires me being critical of them, if that requires me babysitting them, whatever it did, it starts with my own family and works out from there. I pray, and I'm so thankful my daughters love and know Jesus Christ. I have three daughters. They married three wonderful Christian men, and now they're having grandchildren. And I know in my deepest heart that those families are going to grow up Christian. Those kids are going to grow up Christian. And I didn't grow up that way. So in my lifetime, with two atheistic parents, God changed everything in one generation that when I leave, I have a wife of knows and loves Jesus, and I have family, three family members in extension that are going to go do some damage for Jesus. And so, I pray for the harvesters. I consider it a privilege to be asked to help develop those harvesters. And it was never hard for me to do it. Never. I enjoyed every single second of doing it. All right. Last question. Is there any final words you want to say to me? One of the reasons I woke up, it was about a week and a half ago, I looked in the mirror, and I hadn't really looked in the mirror with my clothes off for a while, and I was completely emaciated, like skeletal. And I said, holy mackerel, what a disaster your body is. And I, at that point, I don't know if God gave me this or not, but I remember thinking, I think I only have weeks left, not months or years. And I've been battling this for six, almost six years now. I think I only have weeks left. I think I'm supposed to share that. I don't need anybody to feel sorry for me. That's not why I would share it. I just want to be able to say goodbye to Brian Tome. Otherwise, you don't know how to come to me and say, hey, how long are you going to live? You can't ask that question. My children can't ask that question. So by saying it, I'm trusting God gave me that word so that I can finish with the harvesters. Not everybody, the harvesters, the people 
who will go out and harvest. I want to I want to say goodbye for that reason. Uh, to officially say, hey, I enjoyed the walk. I enjoyed. I enjoyed the journey a lot. I'm so thankful for my life, and I'm so ready. If God says today is your last day, so be it. You know, so my last words to you, Brian, would be simply, um, I'm proud of you. Not in, a, not in a pride that is misconstrued with worldly pride. I'm proud of you because you have a go-for-it spirit, and there's no quit in you, and you haven't chased the wrong things when, when you got to be popular. You haven't chased the wrong things when your ministry's been blessed. You've stayed grounded. You haven't become like other mega pastors, not all, but certainly some. And you have good footing under your feet. I have tremendous faith in your reach out to people. I think you're calling people and reaching people nobody else is reaching, which to me is always exciting. Uh, in particular, men. So few pastors really can reach men like you. And I'm, I'm very impressed by that. But most importantly, trust the vision God gives you and continue to have unwavering faith because it's God who gave you that faith. It's not yours. You didn't develop it. He gave it to you. And I'm sorry I didn't see it earlier, but I see it now. Take it to wherever it takes you and, and help get people into heaven, man, because if there's something else I'm missing, I don't know what it is. But to me, that is the end game. We do a lot of things to see that happen. Don't lose focus on the end game. The end game is if they don't get to heaven, they have no hope. They're utterly hopeless at that point. We have hope until heaven, till that journey is made, and after, there is no hope. So, yeah, I just say keep trusting God's vision inside of you. Thank you. I, some of my deepest, most emotional moments have been in your presence. Not just that time in my house when I gave my testimony for the first time. You know, not just um, right now in the studio. But, you know, just thinking about you leaving me, brother. You've, you've, yeah. another time I cry with you is when you physically left me because you left the high school I was a part of. <laughs> I remember that. Remember, the, remember that talk? Because, you know, man, you've been, uh, we haven't been, you and I have not, um, we, 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 we don't talk every month. Shoot, we've gone years and not talked. It's not like you and I have this, you know, close pen power. We've gone years, but there is a bond that is there that is unmistakable. It's because you've been my, you're my first spiritual father. And um, I'll just I, say I, one more thing. Um, yeah. I was wondering the other day if you can influence from heaven. I started just thinking about that. Can you have influence once you get to heaven? And I don't know if I know this. I think I know this, but as I read the scriptures, no, the answer is you don't have influence. <laughs> can read about Abraham wishing he could send somebody back and warn his brothers, right? When he was in hell, right? And I think that's the story in Lazarus. Yep. Lazarus, yeah. Yep. Please, please warn them. Uh, well, your time, I can't help you anymore. There's no influence anymore from you. And I thought about that. I spent my entire life trying to influence. I mean, my entire life trying to influence people to Christ 24-7, seven, seven days a week, every day. And now I go to heaven, what am I going to do? 
you know? I started thinking, I don't have any, because even doing this project now with the family wins, it's trying to influence, you know? So I just say to you, Brian, realize what a, what a God-given joy and gift it is to be able to influence because God's gifted you and called you. He's done both. He's called you and gifted you to do amazing things. And so your influence is there and he's given you a, a big platform to work on. So and I know you don't take that pridefully. I, I appreciate that, but. I, I don't. Yeah. <clears throat> Denny, I, I love you. Love you too, brother. I love you, and uh, I respect you. Same. I, res I respect the decisions you've made. I respect the way that you're finishing. Um, I am who I am because of you, and um, I couldn't have asked for a better spiritual father. Thank you, my friend. Oh, all right. I think Denny and I are getting dehydrated here. All right. We're dehydrated. Let me... Let me get my sniffles back up. All right. So again, familywins.org. That's a good outcome of this. You want to go check that out and spread that around. I, I just wish and I pray for everybody who's within earshot of this podcast to have somebody who can mother or father you spiritually. And if you aren't having somebody who can mother and father you spiritually, that doesn't affect you being able to mother and father somebody else, you being able to mentor somebody else, you being able to grow somebody else. Life is short, right, brother? I mean, <laughs> a couple of years from now, we're never going to care about the cars we drove or the jobs we had or the paychecks that we made or the the houses that we redecorated. All that all that crap is going to be just that. It's going to be crap. It's going to be flushed down the toys. It's going to be rusting away. But the the relationships we build, the people we love, the lives we propel the next place, will endure us for a long time. And so on behalf, Danny, of everybody who's on your downline, who you've built into, who you've influenced, thank you. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. All right. It's enough of this aggressive life. We'll see you next time. Mm, man. Thank you for doing this, Denny. Thank you. And I don't mean just that this podcast is very draining, I know, but the the this of the last many decades. Mm. It's a pretty short list, Brian, of people I need to see, talk to, and finish the race with, you know? Yeah. But thank you for calling me so that we could do this. And I don't know what God wants to do with a podcast. I have no idea. But I just pray that our relationship, as you described it, will affect many. That this is deeper than the philosophical, theological whatever things we talked about, people will see something much, much, much deeper that's important about our walk with Christ with somebody in this world called a mentor. That, to me, I hope somehow God takes that and runs with it well beyond what you can see or I can see. Yeah, I just pray that. Well, there's going to be fruit from this. We don't know what it is, but this was this was healthy for me to just be able to spend time with you in this way. I'm sorry that it's awkward it was for other people to be looking in and listening, but um, yeah, I think the Lord is pleased here, man. Right now, I get up in the morning, I come into my office, I'm exhausted, but I'm working, you know, so I'm not laying around. I'm on a lot of pain medication. I have two patches on my shoulder to maintain the pain, so I'm not in pain, but I go to the oncologist tomorrow get a scan to find out how many tumors are in my body right now. So I'll find it out tomorrow. And, you know, then I'm not going to fight them anymore. I'm not going to do chemo or uh, radiation or surgery. So that's why it's kind of let it do its course, right? So I've got to that point. I don't have the, I don't have the physical frame to, to do chemo anymore. I can't, yeah, I can't keep up. 
So. Mm. Well, it's it's a it sounds like a trite phrase because it's been used so much, but it doesn't change the truth for your situation. You you have fought the good fight. You have fought. You know what I'm saying? You right. fought. You fought. And and you've won. I hope you know you go to you go up to heaven. You know what happens here is you realize you're going to close your eyes one day pretty soon. And having done 16 surgeries, I've closed my eyes a lot and woken up. And the next time you close your eyes and wake up, what you think was faith becomes reality. You know, you, you're, you're there with Jesus. It's no longer a debate or what do you think. You're with them. And that to me is so on my brain right now because I'm so close, I think that I wish I could say, hey, can I go back and tell everybody about this experience? I want them to know it's really real, you know, but again, you can't influence it anymore. You're done with your, your job of influence is over. So be an influencer, man, Brian, just be an, I know you, I don't have to encourage you. I don't have to encourage you. There's, there's probably 10 people in my life if I do a big circle that I have a tremendous amount of respect for. Number one, bar none, is Amy Patton. I have oh, never, ever met anybody like her. Did you tell her that for me? Okay. Ever, ever. My daughter's have never met anybody like her, ever. They've told me that. <laughs> and then you and Reed and a few others, but there's not a lot who I can look at and say, wow, I'm going to miss you guys. There's probably a lot more than I'm thinking about. I miss you not because we've had weekly fellowship. I miss you because of how how proud I am of you and how you're running your race, how proud I am of you, <laughs> how your attitude about it. <laughs> Just in one sense saying, I don't care if he has a $1.8 million Lamborghini, I'm for it, and then you drive a Chevy truck or whatever, right? <laughs> yeah. you're, not, you're not against either. You just know who you want to be, you know? And that's so mature. <laughs> So mature. So, anyway, I guess this will be our official goodbye, but we'll probably talk before, you know, yeah. the end comes. But mm. it's funny. I, I've always felt like I could control things. And it's really been weird to be out of control mm. for six years. It's not like for six months or five weeks or whatever. It's, it's been really, really weird to say, you mean I got another tumor? I gotta have another surgery. I got, it just you mm. no control over it. It's mm. absolutely out of your ability to deal with. Mm. So appreciate your health, Brian. Appreciate your health. Your body may not seem it's that important, but man, it's really your spiritual life will be good, but still it's really hard when you don't have a body. You know. Well, it's gonna ha it's it's gonna happen to all of us. I mean, yep. that's we're gonna have. It is. It's. It's. So I'm taking a final lesson from you. Hopefully, I don't have to apply that lesson for quite some time yet. But mm. all right, man, I'll let you go. Thanks right, for this friend. opportunity, man. Thank you for doing it. People are blessed. I got to yep. rock, man. I, I love you. I love, love you. Love you too, buddy. All, all right. right. Bye, bye bye. Hey, thanks for listening. For more aggressive living, head over to bryantome.com. Get signed up for the mailing list to get regular shots of positive aggression sent straight to your inbox. And while you're there, you can also find articles, podcasts, and books. I'm also active on Instagram. Search Brian Tome. Special thanks to the band judges for the music. Aggressive Life with Brian Tome is a production of Crossroads Church, Cincinnati, Ohio.